So science has been warning us about climate change for a really long time. If you've looked at the textbooks, you might have heard of a guy named Arrhenius who talked about climate change back in the 1890s. I was taught in grad school, it was a guy named Joseph Tyndall in the 1860s. But it turns out an American woman named Eunice Foote, F-O-O-T-E, beat them all by years. Back in 1853, she first told us how increasing the level of greenhouse gases like CO2 would warm the planet. And boy, did we increase those greenhouse gases. In fact, CO2 levels are about 50% higher than they should be, now higher than they've been in about 5 million years on this planet. As a result of those increase in greenhouse gases, you know the story. What's happened is the planet warmed up, just like Eunice Foote told us it would. In fact, it's warmed about one degree Celsius so far, and it's headed towards a lot more, depending on our future choices. So that's kind of the climate problem. We've heard about it before, you've heard all the details, but what we need to talk about now is solutions. How do we actually stop climate change and get the planet back on track? Well, when we think about climate solutions, you'll hear everything. You'll hear all sorts of claims, all sorts of people with an agenda, a lot of people trying to sell you something are gonna tell you what the solution is. The idea is that you know, if you go on Twitter or Facebook and you ask, what's the solution to climate change? Well, here's one typical set of answers you might get where people are often very confident of telling you they have the solution, the silver bullet, the thing that'll solve it all. Well, be a little skeptical about that and actually do a little science because science can help guide us. It can tell us what might be true, what might be just an assumption, our best guess, and test it against data and make sure that we actually can really be guided by data and not just hype. So the science tells us we actually have a lot of solutions. And Project Drawdown a few years ago, we went and reviewed about 100 major solutions to climate change and asked a lot of deep questions about them. Like, how big could they be? How effective might they be in the future? Are they actually ready now? And what would they cost? And so we looked at lots of solutions, like around energy and funding, you know, rooftop solar. Yeah, that would work and that would help a lot. Interesting things like food waste would help a lot too, because food and agriculture are big contributors to climate change as well. Reducing the waste helps reduce the emissions. We looked across a whole bunch of things, in fact, and built an entire library of solutions. And when you put them together, it's kind of impressive. We can find a whole bunch of solutions here in, let's say, electricity, finding lots of ways to save electricity and to make it without carbon. That's cool. Or we can go over here into food and agriculture and find ways to reduce food waste, change diets, grow food better, and protect ecosystems all at the same time. Or maybe over here in transportation and so on and so on. In fact, we have a library of about 100 very viable climate solutions ready to go on the shelf right here today. But what this work has done so far is it really describes potential solutions. They're viable, they're ready to go, here they are, here are the numbers, but they're still kind of sitting on the shelf compared to what we need to do, which is go out and deploy them and scale them make them much, much bigger than they are today. But that's what science hasn't done very well so far. What we've basically done is written a really good food book with lots of pictures showing you what could be. No, doesn't that look delicious? This is great. But what it isn't is a recipe book that actually tells you step by step by step what to do to make that beautiful thing a reality. So that's what we gotta do now, go from a solutions library to something more like a roadmap, a set of instructions that tell you actually how to do it. So I'm gonna tell you today about this new thing we developed called the Drawdown Roadmap that shows you not only what the solutions are, but how to effectively deploy them in the future because there's some really important rules out there we gotta follow. The first is what are the key paths to stopping climate change? Well, all of the paths that stop climate change basically begin like this. This is a graph showing the history of our emissions of greenhouse gases, the pollution that causes climate change. We're at the red dot. We've been increasing the level of pollution each year over time over the last 50 years or so. And if we just extrapolate it into the future, it'd look like that little dotted line. Well, we sure as heck can't do that. We have to stop this and turn it around and head way back down as fast as we can. In fact, pretty much all the paths that stop climate change that we want basically cut emissions almost in half within the next decade to 15 years. That's incredible, that's a huge amount of work right ahead of us. And then we gotta keep cutting and keep cutting some more into the 2050s. 
realizing that we might not get all the way there. We might not cut the last of all the emissions, but we'll get most of them. But they still won't be zero, probably. So what are we going to have to do? Well, we might have to balance this with a little bit of what's called carbon removal. The idea that maybe we can suck some of that pollution out of the atmosphere. Well, right now, carbon removal is tiny. In fact, even if I multiplied all the carbon removal on Earth by a million, it would still be too small to see on this graph compared to the size of our emissions. It's really tiny. But maybe, just maybe, over time, we could do this in our soils, in our forests, our oceans, and with machines, and scale it up and get into that gigaton scale and suck up some of those remaining emissions. But it's going to take a while and take a lot of work. But when we do this, when we cut emissions drastically and do a little bit of cleanup with carbon removal, we can hit what's called net zero, the point where we are net not polluting anymore by about 2050. This would be great. This is an ambitious plan. This is what stopped climate change somewhere a little bit north of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Okay, let's do it. But one of the key things that a lot of people seem to forget is what I like to call the time value of carbon. The time value of carbon basically tells us that time matters a lot. As we begin to think about our climate change solutions, we see that we have this path heading down, but early action matters a lot. For example, cutting emissions now in the 2020s and early 2030s, that kind of 50% cut in emissions, that's the gift that keeps on giving because we do it now and it keeps on holding emissions down into the future decades again and again and prevents about 900 gigatons of carbon from ever having been put in the atmosphere. So the time value of carbon is kind of like the time value of money. It's like when you save for retirement, you better start now because it'll add up and accumulate over time. You don't wait till you're 64 and try to do it at the last minute. That won't work. So what we have to do is keep on working on climate solutions that give back over time like this and show how we can have climate solutions that work over time, but the early actions matter the most. So as we think about this, we can see how climate solutions get you here and stop climate change in the 2050s, just like this. But the problem is basically cutting emissions is about 94% of the job and 75% of the job is done in the first decade. This is why high tech solutions off in the future really don't do as much as we think. It's the immediate solutions taken now that do most of the work. So most of the work is 75% of it is cutting emissions now, 94% is cutting emissions altogether, and then about 6% will be carbon removal. Well, how does this work over time? Well, one of the things we have to think about is that this is a huge implication for climate change into the future. And as we think about the future, we can work across sectors. That's the most important thing here. So is that what we have here is basically all the different places where we can cut emissions. Uh, this is showing the sectoral breakdown of climate change emissions from electricity, food and agriculture, industry, transportation, and buildings. These are gonna be kind of critical areas for us to cut emissions over time. And then what we have is we can see how we can cut them through gains both in efficiency and through decarbonization, kind of uh, using different solutions to cut emissions by being more energy efficient and also by kind of uh, doing things differently over time. And then we can add indirect ways of cutting emissions. This is through like social interventions, things that invest in people first, like uh, helping indigenous communities protect their land, helping women and girls invest in their future, their healthcare, their education. These are things you do for people, but then in turn kind of have cascading benefits back to climate. And then we can see how we can add carbon removal to the mix towards the end to kind of do the last little bits that we can't do otherwise. So when we do all that together, we can see a whole suite of activities we can do to stop climate change in the future. Uh, we can double click on this and show lots more detail here, but this is essentially kind of Earth's portfolio of what we need to do. This is the target that we should be aiming for collectively as the world, this is what we need to do. So that's great. And we can go through each one and find individual solutions, diving back into that drawdown library, here showing individual solutions around electricity that cut uh, energy efficiency losses, or kind of decarbonize the production into low carbon forms of electricity, for example. 
We can also look for maybe the cheapest solutions because we wanna be cost effective. Uh, here's a graph called a McKinsey style graph where we stack up the solutions to climate change from cheapest to most expensive from left to right. The ones on the left here, if you look over time, what we find is that in fact, these climate solutions save money compared to a fossil fuel world and they do some incredible good for you and make you money over the next 30 years, which is fantastic. So climate solutions are available, they're big, and now we show you which ones are cheapest and what proportion we should do them all. This is a really fantastic way to look at it. And it's what we kind of call Earth's portfolio. This is what the planet has been telling us if we paid attention to the science. This is what we need to do. Now let's compare it to what we're actually doing. Uh, here's again the Earth's portfolio. Well, here's a portfolio of philanthropy, money people donate to do work on climate solutions. And we show that it's actually pretty well balanced. It's not completely off, but you might notice the areas around industry and the kind of other energy sectors, they're relatively light investments compared to others. And we need to do a better job to balance this out. Another big area of funding though is venture capital, much bigger pot of money. About 90 billion a year has been going into venture capital around climate tech lately. By the way, that's about two to three times more than the federal government will be investing through the Inflation Reduction Act. So the private sector is doing a lot, a lot of this in venture capital, but look how whack that is. Venture capital is spending about 60% of the money on transportation, like electric cars and scooters and trying to be Elon Musk again or whatever. I don't know what they're doing. Um, but the climate is telling us it's really 13% of the problem. Why are we putting so much money into one solution when it's actually a relatively small part? We need to balance this out a little bit better and put our money where the carbon is. That would help enormously. The other thing we have to do is not just work better across the sectors we need to do for climate change, we ought to work better across time scales. Again, the importance of time. What we see here is kind of again that graph of what we need to do between now and 2050 to stop climate change. And if we have a portfolio of solutions across different economic sectors, we also need to have a portfolio of solutions across time. Because right now we need to hit an emergency break. What are the things we can do that will begin to bend the curve like right now in the next two to three years, not decades, years? What can we do now? Well, some of those things would be like stopping deforestation. Deforestation today emits about 12% of the world's emissions, about equal to the United States. And yet that number is going up and US emissions are going down. Let's focus on deforestation. Let's focus on methane leaks where methane has a disproportionate impact on climate in the first decade or two. That would be important. Or energy efficiency gains and so on. Things we could do now without waiting. And at the same time, we begin to build out our new low carbon infrastructure. This is going to be, you know, every electricity system, transportation system, agricultural system, industry in the world has to be rebuilt now. And so we do that at the same time, knowing that it's going to pay off a little bit later. We also need to invest in people, especially indigenous communities, women and girls and others for their benefit, but also for long term climate benefit as well. Those seeds will grow and pay off in the future, as will nature based carbon removal kind of farming differently, planting trees differently, farming the oceans and so on. These things will be important, but they take decades to accumulate carbon. So we should do that now and let that decade take over. And then finally, the investments in new technologies, which could also pay off handsomely in the future as well. And top of all that, we have to work across sectors and time as well as geography, because there are a lot of 80-20 rules out there. For example, about 70% of the CO2 from the US power sector comes from 30% of the power plants. And 30% of the methane leaks come from 1% of the wells. So we ought to go into these precise locations where we can have a bigger impact and leverage that impact to kind of make sure we're getting the biggest bang for our buck right here, right now. So how can we use this kind of roadmap? How can we use science to guide us about how we allocate our work across different economic sectors, across time and across geography. Well, we can use that to guide investments, especially guide investments by the private sector, like maybe venture capitalists. It can guide donations by foundations and philanthropists. It can also guide policy in terms of things about how the government spends its money on climate solutions and make sure we're putting it in the right place. Because I can assure you right now, we're not. And we can do a much, much better job. 
So with all of this guidance from the, you know, how we mix it up across sectors, across time and across geography, we can take all of this work and be far, far more impactful and really drive change on climate change in a way that's not driven by hype or agenda, but driven by data and by science. And now, finally, this is available and we're gonna make this available to the world. So when I think about climate change, just to wrap up, of course, we all think of the incredible challenges, the incredible problems that are facing us today, but I also see an incredible opportunity because we're gonna be the first generations in history that could live in a world where we don't have to destroy the planet to advance human well-being. We could live in a world that is truly sustainable. We could live in a world with 100% literacy, with no poverty, and chronic disease is a thing of the past. This is something that generations, thousands of generations before us only could dream of. And today it's just kind of out of reach of us. But if we were to stretch, we could touch it and make it real. So I wanna live for that world. I wanna fight for that world because I can assure you right now, it is not game over, it's game on. This is the time to focus. This is the time to dig in. This is the time to make a difference because we are just within reach of an incredible world that we could have if we only wanted it. So to do that though, we need bold leaders and bold visions to guide us to a better future. And I think some of those bold leaders are probably in this audience today. And I hope some of you will become those and guide us to a better future and build the world that we want. So with that, thank you very much and hope we can enjoy the rest of the day today. Thank you so much.